Hi, uh, welcome uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Am Johal. I'm director of Simon Fraser University's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Uh, thank you for coming out to the talk by Patricia Reed uh, tonight on horizonless uh, futures. I just wanted to begin by uh, acknowledging that we are on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, this talk also uh, is co-presented. Uh, with uh, my office, along with SFU Galleries, Melanie O'Brien is here, SFU School for Contemporary Arts, Elspeth Pratt is here uh, as well, the director of the school, and SFU's Institute for the Humanities. Samir Gandisha isn't here because they're hosting Jason Moore over at um, SFU Harbor Center uh, tonight. Uh, really delighted to have uh, uh, Patricia here. And uh, she's spoken in Vancouver uh, just one time before, I think sometime around 2009 or like 2010. 10 years ago, yeah. Something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And just to briefly uh, introduce her, she's an artist, writer, and designer based in Berlin. As an artist, she's uh, some uh, exhibitions include The One and the Many at CUAG Ottawa, the Museum of Capitalism, Oakland, Homework 7 in Beirut, uh, Wit to Wit in Rotterdam, HKW Berlin. There's a whole lot of other German that I'm going to try not to pronounce. Uh, also, a lot of uh, writing published in pre-platforms, uh, post-meme with punctum books, efflux architecture, xeno architecture, uh, Cold War, Cold World, uh, distributed with open editions, Money Lab 2, Institute of Network Cultures, the, uh, the Neurotic Turn with repeater books. With Victoria Ivanova, she co-curated the 1948 Unbound Tokens session with the House of World Cultures team Berlin in 2017, and was a theory researcher for Public Art Munich in 2018. Uh, she also is a part of the Laboria Kub Kubonics uh, techno-material feminist working group who published the Xeno Feminist Manifesto in 2015. It's been reissued by Verso Books in autumn uh, 2018, so it's just come out uh, very recently. And she's... A pretty good basketball player, too, I'd have to say. <laughs> so uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Patricia Reed. <laughs> thanks, Em. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much, Em. Um, it's really lovely to be here, and thanks to you also, Melanie, for like hosting and um, bringing me here. It's really I've been following the program remotely online, as we do these days. And uh, so it's really an honor to be like part of that, uh, yeah, part of that group. Um, so uh, the talk of my, uh, the title of my talk is On Horizonless Futures, as you see there. Um, so just in general, it's kind of like part of, uh, it's part of like a general interest in working on questions of futurity from the perspective of a resituated human within uh, complex planetary scale conditions. Um, and to sort of think about the consequences that cascade from that. So hopefully that statement will make sense as I go through. If not, just shout and I will hopefully clarify. Um, so what I mean by, uh, and is everyone okay with the volume if I speak like this, it's comfortable? Good. Um, so what I mean by uh, complex planetary conditions is basically a situation of profound interconnectivity that we find ourselves in, um, be that between uh, global economies and deep chains of production, um, that of course include the material resource base that allow us to make anything at all, um, between humans and the Earth, where we see this sort of gluing together of our relatively finite temporality uh, with that of the long duration of geological epochs, so with, this is within anthropogenic climate change. And of course, between uh, humans and technology, uh, where technology sort of fundamentally alter our capacities and change the possibilities of what can be done in the world. Um, but today, they're at a scale uh, where the effects of our capacities sort of outstrip our ability to uh, understand them in this sort of aggregate form. So this condition gestures to the scope of cosmological transformation, to my mind and, and many others. Um, our world models and human self-understanding um, underwent with Copernicanism. So I don't think it's a, it's a kind of expression of generational narcissism to say that we're sort of living in the prehistory of a radically other world. So the question, of course, is what direction and provisional diagrams will be conceived to orient and shape this other world, which, in other words, is a question of futurity, which is always a sort of political negotiation. So this other world, of course, brings with it um, you know, incredible possibilities, but also incredible risks. 
Uh, and yet while these changes abound, our sense of orientation within it remains pretty rigidly locked to ideals of economic growth as glory, as well as earthly partitioning and modes of belonging tethered to 17th century templates of the nation state territorial enclosures. So these factors seem to weigh heavily on, excuse me, political reactions to our condition that tell us the existing economic structures that in part delivered us into catastrophe can also deliver us out of it, so green capitalism. Or those which reinforce state-based ideals to the disavowal of actual interconnectedness via policies of isolationism or blatant nationalism thereby enacting anachronistic ideals for a making great again that never was. The other reaction we see, of course, that isn't just bound to the right, is a rejection of this complexity, usually telling us that we are losing our humanity, celebrating an essentialized human, whatever that is or was, while glossing over many of the atrocities enacted by the human animal throughout history. So all that's to say is I think we're facing questions of a you know, cosmological magnitude where our existing conceptual structures that you know, serve as a sort of driving force behind our organizational geopolitical orders are dramatically even violently out of sync with the complexity of our reality. So that's the sort of general backdrop from which this talk sort of you know, extends. And of course, like speaking of a horizonless futures is, is sort of a bit of a camaraderie, uh, is that how you say it, camaraderie poke at certain critical positions that have been circulating for some time, telling us that the future as such has been canceled. So of course this position is, you know, it's, well, it's sort of partially accurate uh, and still helpful to a certain degree. It seems to be arrested in its own sort of mode of diagnosis. So perhaps I've just sort of grown impatient in reading apocalyptic analyses, but I also fear that they may inadvertently strengthen the perception that our condition is immutable, treating it as if it's not subject to change and as if our destiny is bound to what you know, currently is. So while critical diagnoses and a better understanding of our condition are, are indispensable, there comes a point when their sheer repetition offers us little indication on possible ways out, around, or through them. So today, I'd like to wager that it's perhaps more useful to be wrong while trying to think hypothetically than to be right diagnostically while our condition stagnates. And this is, of course, a particular type or genre of stagnation that isn't immobile. It's on the contrary, it rather accelerates further destruction. So despite the you know, dismal sounding uh, <laughs> title, um, tonight's talk puts an unabashed emphasis on the plasticity of our condition, under the assumption that it could be, and frankly ought to be, otherwise. So it's important to point out, when I mentioned this term, a decentered humanness, um, it's important to point out that, uh, and, and this of course is a focal point for uh, the resurgence of the human that we've seen in discourses, be it in post-humanism, transhumanism, contemporary versions of humanism, and so on, that to speak of a decentered human isn't inherently progressive unto itself. So the narrative arc of this human repositioning is volatile and subject to extreme misuse. Continued injustice among human communities and of course upon the biosphere. But this, I mean, this to me sort of marks the exact reason why we have to be battling over, over this term. So there are plenty uh, on the right libertarian side of the spectrum who also champion this decentered human, but of course so do so jubilantly in favor of computational supremacy that would finally realize an efficiency and superintelligence far greater than our own, displacing us absolutely in the process. All the while, a handful of billionaires escape to the most exclusive of moated communities on floating island seasteads in the South Pacific. Or colonize Mars, whatever. So the non-radiant picture I'm working towards to be clear is not one where our decentering comes to equal dehumanization, but one where our generic self-understanding is relativized to the scale of the planetary and our conceptual models for, for understanding and figuring and constructing cohabitation livability, 
modes of valuation and interrelations uh, are extrapolated from this non-radiant perspective. So all that to say is the premise of the talk is not that we have no future, but that the horizon as a marker of orientation for it is no longer an adequate vehicle for navigating this planetary scaled condition from the repositioned human within it. So I've arrived at this, uh, at this sort of uh, idea, if you will, partly in response to a set of demands uh, set out by Donna Haraway that I've, that I've been returning to a lot this year uh, in her seminal text on situated knowledges. And this is, of course, written uh, you know, almost 30 years ago, or exactly 30 years ago, actually. So she says, um, feminists have to insist on a better account of the world. It is not enough to show radical historical contingency and modes of construction for everything. So this quote seems especially important today, given the blatant attacks on scientific knowledge and reason in the name of halting substantial uh, responses to crises, especially economic and climactic ones, as well as addressing the sort of unintended, wholly caricaturized aftermath we saw with the so-called sociological turn in science studies that has been negatively instrumentalized in the name of upholding political stagnation by casting doubt on the certainty and veracity of scientific claims. So for those of you uh, coming to the seminar tomorrow, we're gonna be reading a great text from Wendy Hui Kyung Chung, um, uh, where she's specifically addressing this, so we can look forward to that. So coming to this problem as a non-scientist, right? I'm an artist and designer. <laughs> I think Haraway's demand holds broader resonance for the arts and humanities too. That in fact, building a better account of reality includes constructing better ways of accessing it. So for us concept-mongering creatures, as Ray Brasset calls us, this includes new language, better metaphors, and ways to bring to perception otherworldly experiences, namely practices, at least in an you know, idealistic universe, um, that are endemic to art. So as Nelson Goodman wrote in his book, uh, Ways of Worldmaking, way back in 78, quote, the arts must be taken no less seriously than the sciences as modes of discovery, creation, and enlargement of knowledge in the broad sense. So although I'm gonna be talking a lot about epistemology tonight, included in that should be sort of a, you know, should be self-understood that there's an inherent demand and responsibility for artists. And perhaps I'm kind of talking to myself a little bit too here. To participate in the construction of better accounts of our condition, a collective condition irreducible to our personal experience, but nonetheless composed of vastly different personal experiences. So this is not only the ambition to better understand our world or our condition, but because, as Brasse notes, our failure to change the world may not be unrelated to our ability to understand it. So understanding and transformability in this picture form a sort of notable dependency. So the, the well-known and sort of important legacy of Haraway's feminist epistemologies has been, of course, as you may guess from her title, to situate knowledge claims by insisting on the partiality of the knowledge maker from which epistemologies, you know, like, come forth. <coughs> including the socio-normative historical context that guide its production and legitimation. So this work, of course, was in critical response to uh, you know, false conceptions of objectivity uh, that were bound to the idea of an impartial observer. And yet, importantly, um, and this is kind of worth emphasizing, I think, is that situated knowledge was never about obliterating objectivity absolutely but rather about redefining what it entails and how it ought to be constituted. So I think that's a point that gets often missed, because you know how these canonical texts circulate, people think they know it, but they're not necessarily reading it. And I think that's a like really important point to mention that this text was not about obliterating objectivity, but about reconstituting it. So what this boils down to is that all knowing involves the historical uh, material conditions, so mind, body, geography, culture, and instruments, of particular knowers and institutions of knowledge acknowledgement. So, you know, another important consequence of this, of this claim, of this move, uh, is, a, you know, and this kind of went part and parcel with a lot of other feminist epistemologies that were, that were different from Haraway's, but nonetheless in the same family, is that they serve to deprivilege the traditional hierarchies within epistemology 
that champion propositional knowledge or knowing that over materialist knowledge practices or knowing how. So it's a really great uh, example in, in a text from Wilfred Sellers where he's talking about the difference between you know, me describing to you that uh, forward motion on a pedal, blah, 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 will propel you forward, you know, i.e. describing riding a bike versus actually riding a bike, right? Two different things. So while situated knowledge, you know, teaches us importantly that epistemology can't be separated from social environmental contexts, and that there is in fact a sort of like bi-directional form of agency between the knowledge makers and the objects of study, I think the consequences of this, of this bi-directionality requires elaboration. Crucially, how knowledge works back upon us as so-called concept-mongering creatures. So this is the first extrapolation demanded of situated knowledges today. How knowledge infiltrates and conceptually re-situates us through the transformative activity of thinking and constructing concepts. A concept or a capacity, we must insist, um, is available to any human. So by this reciprocal formulation, I want to point out that the situatedness of all thought always contains within it the possibility of overflowing its own situation. So such an extended, um, you know, this, this, this bi-directional picture of agency within knowledge creation and its potential for re-situation, right? Like the situation is never fixed. It has resonance with the artifactual mind thesis, or AMT, as well. So according to Tiziano Aydin, AMT is premised on the acknowledgement that, quote, external objects and technical artifacts, rather than just being utilized by an outside world, have shaped and are continuously shaping the very fabric of our thinking, of what we take to be our inside world. Not only are thoughts exosomatically embodied, but the specific physical characteristics of artifacts also activate new modes of thinking, end quote. So this capacity for resituation is, however, it, it's premised on the integration of new knowledge, of learning how to exist in it. It's not merely the acquisition of new knowledge or new tools, but the relation of agency between us humans, of course, nourished by concepts, and the world, or the tools and accounts of reality, at play in the shaping of our artifactual mind. So as the collective glass bead note, this agency is a quality without a specific goal warning us to, quote, not aimlessly blunder into further violence and destruction, end quote. But to give this capacity direction. In other words, this capacity demands a framework, a spatio-temporal guidance to provide it orientation. So it's here we ought to be wary of assuming that knowing alone provides enough motivational force or you know, navigational orientation for changing our behavior, for changing the course for changing the nature of our relations. While of course necessary as a point of departure, sheer informational transmission of knowledge without a broader meaningful narration of how such knowledge intersects with our spatio-temporal, you know, i.e. lived condition, leaves us kind of flailing about in a cognitively dissonant space of simply knowing that, but without existing in the ramifications of that knowing. I think we're seeing a lot of this play out in, in in uh, discussions around climate, like how does something so abstract like the climate start to actually you know, shape and motivate our, our, our collective behavior otherwise? Um, you know, so clearly, we, it's one thing to know of this impending catastrophe, but clearly that's not enough to actually shape things. So we haven't quite figured out how to exist or how to live with the ramifications of that knowing. Um, so the second factor I think that needs to be expanded upon for our situated knowledges um, concerns complexity and the ways we are even able to access the world today. Um, so the planetary objects of our time requiring substantial political mobilization are distributed and complex, meaning that although they of course produce empirical, local or situated effects that can be sensed and are deeply unevenly felt, so in the case of climate change, this is often retracing colonial trajectories, of course. Um, they only come into existence as a systemic whole via procedures of computational averaging and abstraction. So this, of course, is the famous distinction between the weather versus the climate, right? You can feel the weather. It's usually rainy here in Vancouver, I'm told. 
Um, but that does not constitute the climate, right? The climate is averaged over time, space, and multiple geographies. Um, so a broad array of types of knowledge is required to co-construct a diagram of this reality. So a, re a reality that is multi-situated across bodies, materials, geographies, and knowledge practices, yet one that is still coherent nonetheless. So a one world that contains many human and non-human worlds within it, as Ashil Membe frames it. So the type of cognition required for better grasping these complex systems is equally distributed, meaning that it traverses multiple humans, carriers and devices able to model phenomena individual humans cannot. So it's a collective cognition outside of our indi individual situated selves and capacities. So this you know, starts to point to a need for a concept of distributed situatedness in order to adequately account for the complexity of our world, conditioned as it is by intersecting crises that you know, they supersede the capacities of any single, even heroic, mind. So as the designer uh, Ben Servany has noted, the problem space, to borrow a term from programming, the problem space of our reality is no longer conceivable at a human scale. Yet when the possibility for changing it is bound to our capacity and better understanding it, operating in a mode of, of withdrawal from this complexity by emphasizing only the here and now of our present experience leaves us, to my mind, cognitively and instrumentally enfeebled. And so the third factor, again, to kind of work on some sort of update for these uh, situated knowledge claims, a third factor concerns a multi-scalar demand for situated knowledges. So from what perspective do we define situatedness at all? From the perspective of a human phenomenological system that emphasizes selfhood and personal experience, and of course the horizons present to us at any given moment? Or do we take the long view perspective of the humans as a species, what we may call a generic human situatedness? So I think the answer is not about picking one side over the other, or picking one scale over the other, but requires sort of like working on the ways these two modes you know, constitute each other, uh, and the way they sort of form a continuum, and this would be not unlike uh, the American pragmatic philosopher, uh, Wilfred Seller's pro uh, philosophical project for a stereoscopy between a scientific image of the human, uh, which is basically our sort of counterintuitive ways we come to envision ourselves, through, say, a scientific uh, techniques, and a manifest image, or the lived experiential reality of the human. So there's a project in bringing them together, and importantly, there's not a hierarchy of one or the other. It's not that the manifest image is a slave to the supremacy of the science image. These, these two form a sort of binocular vision, ideally. So urging this knowledge into a lived reality I think highlights a crucial side of labor and struggle for bringing the scientific or the abstract knowledge of the world and the domain of our manifest experience of self-understanding into this sort of synthetic relation. So I think also a, a pretty interesting site of labor as well for, for the arts, uh, if I'm, uh, yeah, honestly speaking. So our particular condition carries with it the, the possibility of remapping human self-understanding in and with the world in order to draw out other spatial approaches to it, if we were to hold on to any sort of you know, realist optimism, which is frankly getting a little bit more difficult day by day. So the fact that we have the capacity to conceptually digest or even frame this condition is an example of our human exceptional unexceptionalism. So through our rather exceptional capacities for reasoning and self-reflection, we come to realize that we can unexceptionally be carved up into chemicals and atoms and DNA, in the end, as Nina Power says, not so far from a piece of fruit. So this generic situatedness amounts the capacity of human reason to reach for something, as Reza Negrostani notes, that may cause the human itself to be displaced. And this is what he puts forth under the term inhumanism. So just to be clear, inhumanism is not inhumane, but it's a kind of extension of exceptionalism under humanism that, of course, was championing uh, the capacities of reason in humans, but actually follows this capacity for reason to a logical end, which can then come to recognize its own relativity, its own non-radiance. 
So this new generically situated human self-image opens conceptual and material pathways for navigating the world otherwise, departing, of course, as it does from an altogether different position and perspective, and from which alternative geometries or you know, new spatio-temporal relations ought to derive. So it's here, of course, where we got to raise the red flag, the, the sort of looming red flag that's been hovering over the discussion to late, um, the facility with which I'm using the word human in the first place. Um, there's an important battle to be waged for this third factor of generic human situatedness, since we can't just simply throw around the word human as if it's a self-evident category. So while the human as a generic category is today, I think, essential, and something like anthropogenic climate change, you know, it, it scientifically lumps us into a common subject of natural history, as Tristan Garcia you know, beautifully notes in his book, We. It's far from an ethically or pragmatically given category. So the planetary scale of crises we face demand a response from a collective agent of a comparable, uh, comparable scale, so a generic human, but we cannot ignore the you know, uh, historical and continuing exclusivity of such categorical designations. So if the capacity for reasoning, or our inhuman, exceptional, unexceptionalism, is taken as a sort of crucial defining property of the human, then social exclusion from this category is equal to dehumanization. So in view of the history of struggles around the category of the human, it would be an error to imagine a sudden manifest sense of solidarity amongst members of this scientific category, even though I think we desperately need it. So the category of human may hold, of course, scientifically, but the universality of this scientific classification does not measure up with the long-running socio-political battles over the scope of its enclosure. So although there is a disconnect between the universal scientific framing of the human and the non-uniform partiality of its manifestation, I still think we should not abandon this critical category. So this battle can ultimately be seen as a sort of conflict between the ontological or what there is in the world and the logical or how we make sense of what there is in the world. So on the ontological view, the category human, it exists, and all humans are scientifically accounted for in this view. On the logical view, which is of course counting in the world, most humans have been historically omitted from this measure. So those bodies and concepts that, that ontologically belong to our world, but logically do not count, have been deemed inexistent in the parlance of the philosopher Alain Badiou. So the, for the human to live up to this ontological reality, the collective battle is that of the transition from the inexistent or simply being to existence or appearing and counting. So it's on this plane that we must fight for the coming into logical existence of the universal human if this category is to gain political weight. It's only then that we could be said to exist in what we know, again pointing to the important difference between simply knowing something and existing in the consequences of that knowledge. So without this logical becoming or existing in knowledge, we will remain bound to the inexistent human, a generic humanity that is politically intractable and ensnared in a quagmire of merely knowing that we know that the human is a collective category. So while the category human is politically urgent and ontologically true, it will remain a veil for ahistorical claims without consequence until it becomes logically manifest, until it counts and manifests as something. So I think it's interesting to bring in the, the thinker uh, Sylvia Winter into this, um, whose thought is, is similarly helpful with, with a consequential vector who, who sort of saw in, in Foucault's concept of the episteme more than just this politics of truth as is typically associated with that idea. So the episteme can be thought of as the very root, perhaps one even may say like cosmological condition, that you know, it buttresses what, what comes to count as knowledge, how knowledge is adjudicated, and what even constitutes a valid question or pursuit of knowledge in the first place. It's a kind of precondition for, for, any, for any knowledge claim. And of course, for, for Foucault, uh, this episteme is, is evolving over time, producing historical discontinuities. 
And for Sylvia Winter, the episteme goes, goes beyond just the, the truth machine, uh, regimes and permeates life itself, instituting new genres and, in her words, governing codes of being human. So there's an interesting correlation here between these like ground, almost cosmological or preconditions and new regimes of, of being human. So to repeat Haraway's insistence that we need a better account of the world, and of course I would add to this reality because of course our, uh, we're no longer just on talking about the earth anymore, one that measures up to the increasingly complex, insensible and distributed qualities of our condition in common. This extends to the realm of language and metaphor which frames our correlation to reality and the spatio-temporal concepts that guide our sense of orientation in the world. So to transform our accounts of reality is to enable alien perspectives and geometries through which to both navigate the world otherwise and create new modes of relation. Rather than resorting to what was, what is, or what we think we know. So when a defining step of political reconstruction in the words of Negrostani is predicated on quote, understanding and imagining what ought to be done in our world from the perspective of the postulated possible world, end quote, we need to begin by imagining the otherworldly consequences that a resituated human image might entail and draw out other geometrical relations unbound to human bias, whose historically Euro-modern, of course, the hegemonic uh, geometries, rationalized a split between humans and nature, between figure and ground, in molding a world in our own image. The consequences, of course, we negotiate today with ferocious realism and deeply unevenly so. So this other world's, of course, inexistent. It's only accessible by way of, hy of hypothesis, by way of reasoned narrative constructions that you know, exceed our account of known or accounted for reality. So in this way, demanding a better account of reality must also include this fourth dimension, a hypothetical dimension. So an epistemic project must be able to speculate on what is not yet accounted for if knowledge is to forge pathways beyond the stagnation of what is, beyond the tyranny of existing perspectives towards what could be otherwise. So to think in fidelity to, uh, to the demand for a better account of reality, it's not enough to show, of course, how knowledge is built or through which institutional mechanisms it becomes legitimized, nor merely know uh, what we newly know from it. Emphasis and attention needs to also be put on the construction of certain narration, you know, stemming out of it. So the epistemic assistance on a better account of reality cannot be uh, disconnected from practical extensions or use value of how that knowledge ought to be practiced, of how we ought to exist within it consequentially. Now again, to repeat, it's indispensable to, to map our existing terrain we find ourselves in, including the predispositions that have you know, legitimized this historical trajectory, but it's equally crucial to speculate on the locations, means, and alternative uh, narrations and geometries to make the current entirely destructive path we are on an object of history. So thinking of futurity away from this principle of the horizon, it indexes, indexes um, a need to conceive of a future that isn't optimized in our own image, for a new genre of being inhuman, yet one wherein distinctly human relations could also potentially flourish. So this horizonlessness to which I'm referring should only be understood as sort of temporarily in the negative, since I don't yet have a, an alternative worked out to affirm, so I'm not talking about a, a negation from geometry, but I haven't yet figured out what that may be. Um, what is important, however, is not to suggest we do away with the rationalization of space, which geometry in general, of course, articulates, but that we construct new geometrical relations to reflect this re-situated position within reality. So it's maybe important to point out that the consequences of uh, you know, geometry aren't merely of interest to specialist mathematicians and so on and so forth. Um, it's not just an exercise for them. As the philosopher Yu Kui has noted, geometry forms this positive feedback loop in that it both demands and allows for the spatialization of time, which then gets you know, exteriorized through technical means, informing the way we sort of understand causal relations. 
So since technicity renders these conceptual geometries material, right, we have a transition from the, from the concept, the model, to a material, and turns them into a matter of practice, the mechanization of geometry participates in the constitution of experience and history. So otherwise said, geometry participates in the shaping of culture and everyday life common sense of norm constitution. So there are several reasons why the horizon provides, uh, proves to be an inadequate orienting device for our complex condition and our non-radiant position within it. So first, the horizon as you know, a principle and ubiquitous metaphor for that which is everything that's to come, right? It's, it's always on the horizon, it's not yet actualized, is of course bound to our particular human system of optics as bipedal, upright creatures with binocular vision, eyes in the front of the face, right? Not here and there. Uh, and our head facing forwards. So with the horizon, of course, the world tapers off at a vanishing point, while reality, of course, very much persists beyond such an illusory point, outside the reach of our immediate capacities to perceive it. So in this way, horizons are a mere articulation of our human biosensory limitations, a limitation captured by the chasm between what we can perceive of reality, phenomenologically speaking, and what we can know of it through other means. So of course, from a scientific angle, we've known about this gap uh, for some time, but the relative proximity carved out by this particular rationalizing mode of the horizon, I think it also has more immediate interhuman consequences as well, wherein I think our behaviors come to be acceptable by us so long as the ramification of that behavior takes place beyond a vanishing point. So despite the increased interconnectedness of our planetary condition, feminist thinker of the common, Silvia Federici, notes that there's, quote, a widening of distances between what is produced and what is consumed, intensifying the blindness to the blood and the food we eat, the petroleum we use, the clothes we wear, and the computers we communicate with, end quote. She's framing this as processes of globalization in the general, but I would prefer to specify it as a particular instance of globalization, namely unilateral globalization, to sort of paraphrase from Yu Kui. In this observation, she sort of compels us to escape our state of irresponsibility concerning the consequences of our actions, to arrive at a new perspective from which to, quote, overcome the state of oblivion. So this question of responsibility demands a corresponding adjustment to how we conceive of our actions in space and time namely an underlying and commensurate geometrical premise without uh, the unreal enclosure of a vanishing point. So it's my hypothesis here is that as our conditions become progressively interdependent and entangled, rather than the world becoming smaller as is the typical narrative goes, is actually becoming bigger. In this bigger world, the horizon no longer stands for what once perhaps was a marker of distance and expansiveness, but serves rather to plot a sort of false enclosure of a small world in conformity with a relatively intimate and personal scale. So the horizon in this picture operates as a container for the here and now, an illusory border obfuscating the extent of our condition, thereby placing you know, a sort of limiting conceptual constraints on how we understand our relations with each other, causation, our relations to other entities, our behavior and consequences in general as well as the scope of the environment within which these take place. So in a moment where nationalisms are on the rise, I think it's worth to pointedly contrast this bigger world picture with their isolationist world picture. A picture that besides being, you know, just simply violently unjust, is also quite erroneously a very small world. So a second limiting factor for the horizon is that it refers only to you know, the spatio-temporal schema for the surface world before us, right? The front-facing eyes. Not behind, nor adjacent, and especially not the material reality under our feet that, of course, supports all manner of energy and production. So if we're to construct a geometrical schema that better accounts for the means of survival and, frankly, survivability in this world, surface geometries no longer suffice to account for the deep production chains that work today. In fact, you know, these deep production chains are in part, uh, and their cascading effects are precisely what we, the part of the mess we find ourselves in today. So from the raw materials deep below the Earth's crust, 
to undersea cables through to orbiting satellites, most of these never make an appearance within the confines of a horizon, but of course enable all manner of relation today, pointing to the need for a multi-perspectival geometry in order to sort of usher these systemic dependencies within the sort of purview of perceptibility for you know, political negotiation. So I'll just end by you know, pointing out a, a couple of points here. So given the fact that I've put so much discussion in this, uh, or so much emphasis on reason and modes of rationalization in this discussion tonight, it seemed just helpful to sort of clear up once and for all some lingering perceptions of, of rationality being some of the cold opposition to, to qualities like compassion and care. Um, a politics, of course, of which lies at the crux of, of, of many important feminist struggles, not least of which is you know, one I happen to be involved in. So as Nina Power has noted, you know, compassion and reason are not, not mortal enemies. And it's of course worth to point out that relations of care cannot be strictly figured or limited to the scale of the intimate and the personal, right? They're not just about caring for people in our family and so on. Of course they exist at that scale, but they need to be mobilized across scales if we are to assume causal responsibility for behavioral consequences that you know, ripple far past the vanishing point. So at a certain proportion, epistemologies and care are entirely codependent entities. Since care among humans and non-humans must extend to our biosphere conditions that sustain us, demonstrating that care must be interwoven with robust epistemological endeavors. So we cannot adequately care if we do not possess better accounts of reality that shape us and, shape us and instruct us on how to care. And although we cannot directly care for everyone, now over seven billion of us, or every other species, we ought to care that they are cared for. So to conclude, I'd just like to put this in a little bit of a historical uh, umbrella, or, or framing, if you will. So it's worth noting that it's no mere coincidence that the horizon you know, came into representational preminent, uh, prominence during the Renaissance uh, via, of course, classical perspective, which I'm sure we've, we're, we're all very familiar with, and the sort of mechanization of vision that, that came on with this. So this sort of started happening at the same time as you have the birth of humanism. So the two are sort of mutually reinforcing uh, projects that stem from the sort of same conceptual um, predisposition. So today, as we plot the trajectory of the humanist human towards the exceptionally unexceptional inhumanist human in an age of planetary scaled complexity that is of course to remind a human that can, can cognize themselves as non-radiant hypothesizing its corresponding uh, geometric articulation becomes a sort of evident necessity on how to how to learn how to reinforce and how to practice and mainly how to exteriorize our generic non-radiance so thanks for your attention <laughs>